want to do in the next 15 minutes or so is really um, take some time to put some context around how we got to where we are today. Because I think one of the things that's abundantly clear is that the way in which the legal industry exists, the way that buyers are buying legal services, the way that law firms, whether you're solo or a big law, uh, although big law might be the dirty word of the day, uh, the way that you're going to market with your services has changed. Um, and the way people are buying services has changed. So what I'd like to do is if we jump right into the presentation, is I'd like to spend 15 minutes or so with you talking about what's changed and where we are today. It's obvious that there are some cracks in the foundation and that we are starting to see some changes in the way that legal services are bought and sold in the market. Um, if we go to the next slide, Okay, so one of my slides was missing there, but I'll, I'll just talk to it rather than showing it on screen. Um, when we talk about the legal market in Canada, what are we actually talking about? There's been a lot of like riffing on large law. There's been a lot of talking about going in house and maybe that's a better alternative. When we talk about global large law, we're really talking about 15 firms. And in the Canadian context of those 15 firms, maybe five or six of them are actually truly global. There's another 60 of them or so that are 50 plus. And then as we go down market, we have about 480, so not even 500 firms that are in that 11 to 49 space. And then we get into corporate departments where we have about 12,000 corporate departments in the country. Of the 12,000 corporate departments that are in the country, roughly a third of them are offshoots of US or global offices elsewhere. About a third of them are solo departments. So it's an individual legal counsel set up in Canada to represent the Canadian operations of a particular organization, or it's a small Canadian organization that has one internal attorney or one internal lawyer. And then you have about a third of them that are actually decently sized corporate departments akin to what we would see in a law firm. And then finally, when we talk about smaller solo firms, we're looking at approximately 21,000 firms. And the reason I bring that forward is because the bulk of those 21,000 firms are people like you on the phone today. They're people like you who are part of the Good Lawyer Network. Um, you make up the bulk of the volume of lawyers in Canada. You make up the volume of people who are buying and selling legal services. And while white papers and thought pieces and all of this are written with large law, global large law, medium law firms in mind, the reality is that the bulk of the legal market in this country is actually smalls and solos. So I just think that it's a really important way to level set. And then if we go beyond what's happening in the industry in terms of the cracks and things, of, things are starting to fall apart a little bit, we'll notice that there are really um, three driving forces, three pillars of change. And those three pillars of change are the demographic shift. So I want you to think about where we are today in 2021 and think about technolo technological enhancements that have happened over the course of the last, not even 20 years, the course of the last 15 or 14 years, if you want to be exact. Does anybody remember, and, and you probably can't interact with me, but what happened in 2007? There were some really important technological changes that happened in 2007. The biggest one of which was this, right? The iPhone came about in November of 2007. And what's interesting is that in less than three months from the time it was released, 1 million units were sold. What's more interesting is if you think about those technological enhancements in the last 14 years, and you think about the people who in 2007 are today your third, fourth, fourth, fifth year associates, they don't know life as an adult without this. So the way they interact with the world, the way they interact with information flow, the way they interact with technology is very different than any of us that sort of remember what it was like before then. And I don't want to age myself, but if you think about what life was like pre-smartphone, we tended to be a little bit slower. We tended to take a little bit more time to get back to people. Saying to somebody, oh, I'll get back to you was a bit more of uh, it was a bit more realistic. And some of the mental health issues that we're talking about, some of the mental health issues that, and, and sort of what maybe makes pressures on lawyers a little bit different, were different pre-iPhone. So I just want to think about that. In 2007 was also the year that Tesla announced that they were looking at battery-operated cars. Facebook and Twitter went global. So really in the last 14 years, our sense of communication, our sense of interaction, our sense of connectivity to the world 
has dramatically changed. The next thing that happened was a giant market shift. So when I talk about the three pillars of change, we're talking about a demographic change, a technology change, and then a market shift. 2007, we had this great opening of the technology market with things like the smartphone. 2008, we have the financial crisis. Now, Canada was a little bit sheltered than the rest of the world in the way, certainly from our American counterparts, in the way that we manage the financial crisis and in, in terms of our banking and regulatory laws. But what did happen in 2008 is that buyer power shifted. And law firms started to say, rather, buyers of legal services started to say, we're not going to give us, we're not going to take whatever rate you give us. Around 2008 is also when we started to see $1,000 an hour billable rates for the first time. And companies who couldn't afford to pay those kinds of rates or could afford to pay them, but were being more judicious with how they were spending their law firm budgets, were saying, hold on a minute, I'm not just going to pay you what you want. Let's talk about something called value. And so in 2008, coinciding with the financial crisis, we started to get this idea around value-based billing. We started to get this idea that law firms were in a business and it really shifted buyer power. And it really encouraged people to start thinking very differently about the way that they bought and sold legal services. At the same time, technology is becoming cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. And over the course of the next 10 years, you start to things, see things really change and you start to see a market really exploding. In 2019, we have the recovery and everybody's kind of getting back to net life. It's been 10 years since the great financial crisis. Life is starting to emerge anew. Um, and then we get hit by the pandemic in 2020. So we're going to talk about these three shifts a little bit more, and then we're going to get into a couple of other things. So if we go to the next slide, you'll see when we talk about technology enhancement over the course of the last 10 years, moving from 20, 2008 to 2018, we're really talking about a billion dollar investment in the legal industry in technology alone. We have a new law category being uh, created with a $25 billion market in Canada. Um, and sorry, my slides seem a bit out of order here, but that's okay. We can talk about the new ways of working. So if you wanna talk about the demographic shift, we can actually talk about the ways in which people have started to change the way they think. So again, these, these people in 2007 with their iPhones, we've started going from nine to five to working anywhere, anytime. We've started looking at, um, disaggregated information and the ability to share information. Previously, we held information very closely in the new world, in the new way of working. Um, we see the evolution of the employee wanting to share information because again, everybody has access to similar information or thinks they should have access to similar information. And so I'll, I'll make sure that the, our friends and good lawyers share this image um, with you more specifically so you can dive into it a little bit, but it really talks about some of the shifts that we've actually seen happening as a result of the pandemic. We've seen um, the corporate structure is no longer something that appeals to people and people recognize that their careers can be much more um, fluid than just an upward mobility and an upward trajectory. We're starting to see that lateral movement and lateral experience becomes more important. And then when we talk about technology, if we go to the next slide, this is where we get into that technology investment that I was talking about, the $1, million, $1 billion in investment in legal since 2018, um, recently, we saw Lutera Microsystems acquiring Kira at the beginning of this year. And you're seeing more and more of these acquisitions in the Canadian marketplace alone, let alone in the global stage. We're seeing things like uh, Clio reaches unicorn status, which was quite amazing for a small company that, you know, based in Vancouver and is taking over the small law market. You're seeing things like new models emerge in Clifford Chance where, um, lawyers are being compensated, not just on the billable hour. In fact, the billable hour is only one small element of their compensation. And they, they tried that with some of their offices in the Far East first. You're seeing things like Clearly X, which is an in-house or captive ALSP. And you're seeing those pop up all over um, Canada as well. And I mentioned in, in one, of our, one of the previous sessions, talking about it's hard to go from big law. You can go from big law to small law, but you can't go backwards. Well, the ALSPs are one of the places that you can. And you can go from a smaller lawyer into joining an ALSP if that's something that is of interest to you. We're also starting to see with the demographic shift, with the technology shift, and with the change in the marketplace, that changes in legal education are coming. And so, you, you know, we talked a little bit with Dean Holloway at the very beginning of today's lectures. Um, we talked about changes in legal education and how Calgary is very innovative. We talked about some of the different programs that they're doing there. 
But even Ryerson, um, that just, you know, our, our new law school in, in the country, our 23rd law school in the country, they have business of law and coding courses that are mandatory and part of their uh, curriculum in the L3 and the L2 years. So that's a very different thing to think about as well, not just the LPP program, but there's also innovations taking place right in the classroom. Most importantly, traditional law firms are projected to lose 10 to 20% of market share by 2025. That's not really far off. Um, and I think that's a really interesting statistic to think about where they're going to lose that market share from and who's going to be picking it up. And I think, you know, there's lots of ways we can speculate about what that's going to look like. I want to talk a little bit about, I mentioned that when we look at the new ways of working and we look at some of the ways in which we've changed the way that we work, whether it's because of a millennial push and people who just engage with information and technology differently, or we're talking about the acceleration as a result of the pandemic in the last two years. Um, if we go to the next slide, you'll see that everybody is talking about it. Everybody is talking about how COVID-19 has forced changes on majority of law firm practices. We've seen that the pandemic has created a crying need everywhere for a new kind of legal assistance. And there's a huge opportunity to for lawyers to reinvent themselves in that space. And I think Josh's story today is a great example of that. And we'll see that COVID-19 will turbo turbocharge the legal industry transformation. If you think about all the things we've talked about today, I think they've come to a head. I think they've come to a place where in you know, the tail end of 2021, moving into 2022, we're really going to see things differently. But don't just take my word for it. Why don't we look into some numbers? If we go to the next slide, we can actually dig into what some of the data is saying. What some of the data is actually telling us is that there's increased price sensitivity in the market, even increased from where they were in 2008. We're seeing much more of an increased engagement around this idea of value that we saw pop up in 2008. We're seeing accelerated innovation and digital transformations. Particularly, we're seeing investments in technology. Largely, we're seeing some of those investments in technology because firms are not investing in partner draws. They're reducing salaries of fears. We've seen a fair bit of that um, when the pandemic first hit in March of 2020. There were lots of articles written and lots of uh, partners interviewed about how their draw was being cut back as a result of some of the changes that were happening. And an 81% reduction in discretionary spending. That being said, 84% of partners expect investments in technology. So it's a really interesting time. It's a really interesting moment to be where we are today in the market where all of these things are happening. And ultimately what it means is that there's client pressure, law firms and the legal industry at large needs to change the way it activates. And we need to have more creative marketing and business development efforts. We go to the next slide. It's just a, a good quote from one of my colleagues at Thomson Reuters, that the pace of change caused by globalization and some of these other things we've talked about the disaggregation of legal services and the emergence of alternative legal service providers and disruptive technologies, thank you, good lawyer, preparing lawyers for the future needs of the profession is of critical importance because what we do as lawyers supports the rule of law affecting not only those clients we serve, but also society. Ultimately, we have, we're seeing new markets and new customers emerge. Uh, if we go to the next slide, we're seeing that the demand for legal services will remain, notwithstanding the pandemic. And that technology has streamlined many of the costs and improved productivity in law firms. The demand for legal services has not stopped. What it has done is shifted and changed, it, changed in ways that I think many of us wanted to see happen 10 and 20 years ago. And it's finally coming to a point where we're seeing it today. Ultimately, what we need to do if we go to the next slide, I believe the industry needs to do is to think creatively and do differently. We need to assess for talent. Uh, differently. And we need to think about the uberfication of the world and think about platforms like Good Lawyer and what they do for access to justice, what they do for providing lawyers with an alternative outside of the law firm matrix. We also know that law firms are fast followers. If we go to my last slide, um, we need to disrupt the industry. We're not going to do it on our own. So we need some brave voices in the audience. <coughs> Excuse me. And some of those brave audiences are with us right here and right now. So with that, we are going to launch into a panel discussion. And thank you once again, Good Lawyer. Pardon me for a moment.
I just spoke very, very quickly because I noticed time was running out there. So we have some of those brave voices and brave innovators in the legal space with us here today. We're going to launch into our panel discussion around the future of the profession from law school to sandboxes. And like my former panels, what I'm going to have is I'm going to have um, everybody introduce themselves and I'm going to start with Martine. So Martine, if you could introduce yourself, why you're here today, um, a little bit about your journey into the legal industry and um, why you're excited to be a part of this panel on from the future of the profession from law school to legal sandboxes. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you very much, uh, Zina. And many thanks to Good Lawyer for organizing this event. I think it's a much needed time to get people together to talk about uh, these important issues. Like for those of you who have not seen me before, my name is Martine Boucher. Um, I'm a big fan of all things that relate to legal innovation. Um, I started my journey a long time ago in a small town in Quebec, and that took me all the way to Montreal in the in the big law setting. So I spent uh, my 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 share bit of time working at big law until one of my clients came and recruited me. So made the move from big law to big corporation. Uh, was with GE for about five years, associate general counsel. So uh, we were de- doing legal ops probably before legal ops even was a term, but uh, GE was very um, famous or infamous, would say some, <laughs> for managing uh, the team of lawyers. So I, I learned a lot during my time with GE about process improvement and how, how to manage law as a uh, business function which inspired me uh, to start my own firm. So about 10 years ago, left GE and saw a hole in the marketplace for in-house counsel on demand. Uh, There was not a lot of that back then. There were a few people giving a a chance to this model. And um, my background being from Quebec and having moved to Alberta to serve my client, I thought there was really an opportunity to do it on a digital basis, fully virtual and serving clients all across Canada. So, cause that was my, my special card. I'm a member of the Law Society of Quebec, Ontario and Alberta, and I'm fluent in, um, in French and English, or I hope I am in English, but yeah, you'll be the judge of that. So, um, so I started Simplex Legal with uh, my business partner and now partner in life, Jeff Best, who's a non-lawyer, a terms that he loves to hear about. If you ever want to have a, a really vivid conversation, just call him a non-lawyer. You'll uh, quickly see that he's also a non-jugger, you know, a non-drummer, a non-rapist. There's many things that he's <laughs> not, including a non-lawyer. Um, so I think that combination of bringing people that are not lawyers Um, that's, that's a theme that's very dear to me because that's how we set up our business, but that's also how we've, we see the world evolving and the need for innovation. So fast forward to today, we've got over 25 professionals practicing in five provinces and helping clients, uh, everything from the blue chip, the big banks, insurance companies to, uh, startups and, uh, uh, legal tech innovators. So we really have a, a really big range. I would say we operate at the intersection of people, technology, and process, which with all of that, you can understand my passion for the topic and why I'm here and love this discussion. And I'm here with my very good friends. So I will leave them to introduce themselves and share their own passion there. Thank you, Martine. Uh, Mitch, you can go next. Sure. Um, thanks, Ina. Uh, so I'm Josh Weinberger 20 years later. So Josh, this is what you look like in 20 years. Sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's just the way life is. But yeah, I started, I started in big law, bounced around a couple of firms. I was in-house um, at the city of Toronto as well. And uh, really not feeling the love for the law or what I was doing there. And so I, I uh, took a break and uh, created a, a writer center, which is completely different from, from law. And then I came across this guy called Richard, Richard Susskind. So at that time, this is about 2008, 09, uh, Susskind's book, The End of Lawyers, came out. And I had been trying to puzzle over what the heck I had done with my life 
and why, you know, I was feeling this way, why I wasn't feeling the love for law. And I started reading him. I was kind of going, okay, great. There's, I'm not the only one who feels this way. I got some kind of kindred spirit, albeit on the other cross, on the other side of the ocean. And at that time, I was doing some writing as well. And Jordan Furlong, who you guys all know, was a editor of the Canadian Bar Association magazine called The National. And uh, I pitched him this article and saying, you know what? I, I'm not feeling in love. I want to write an article on what a future law firm would actually look like because everybody's talking about stuff that you should do, but nobody puts it together and says, Hey, this is what it looks like. Take a look. He goes, sure. Okay. Whatever. So I did, I wrote an article called 2020 vision, which we're now well past 2020. And um, pe- the reaction I got from the article was very interesting because people were writing to me saying, Oh my God, I loved your article. I thought it was real. I wanted to apply to this law firm because I'm so unhappy at the law firm I'm at and going, wow, like there's even more people who are unhappy. And so that led me to uh, write my book called Avoiding Extinction, which takes it to the next level. Um, And then The Great Legal Reformation, which is a a lot of stories and about law firms around the world who are doing things differently. Because when you break out of Canada, you break out of North America, you start to see, wow, there's a whole world out there doing stuff completely differently and have different thoughts about how legal should be provided. And that led me to teach at the University of Ottawa Law School, a course on legal innovation. Then I moved to University of Calgary, where I'm the Gowling WLG visiting professor in legal innovation, which is a real mouthful. And uh, so I teach a course on that. I've been doing that for a few years. I do consulting um, on legal innovation. And I'm also building out the legal department for Alune International, where I'm at today, trying to build the in-house legal department of the future. And I'm just really happy to be invited to speak to the panel. Thank you. And certainly not... The least or the last, Paul, we'll turn it over to you. Thanks very much, Zina. A real pleasure to join Mitch and Martine and you this afternoon, and thanks to Good Lawyer for the invitation. Uh, I'm Paul Payton. It, uh, I've worn many different hats, as you've heard others wear, wear different hats through the career, but my current title is Lawler Chair of, um, or the Lawler Professor of Law and Ethics at the Faculty of Law at the University of Alberta. I'm currently on leave from that position to serve as interim CEO of the Canadian Bar Association. And I just caution, my apologies for the disclaimer, any of my comments are personal to me and are not representative of or reflective of anything from the Canadian Bar Association. So I'm in that role right now as interim CEO, scheduled to finish that up at the end of the year. But for the better part of 25 years, I've actually been involved in looking at the way in which lawyers are regulated and engaged in the profession as practicing lawyer, as policy advisor, as in-house counsel, as consultant, and as academic. And I wanna take people through a little bit of that journey because it really dates back to some of the reforms in the late night and debates in the 1990s that put into context what's been happening so rapidly over the last two years and why I actually object to the title of this panel focusing on legal education to sandboxes, because at least with the work I've done in Arizona, here's a preview, they've moved well beyond. So in terms of the stuff that I was doing in the late 1990s, I actually started off uh, clerking, went to big law. I was actually an associate and then a partner practicing commercial litigation with what was Davies Ward and Beck in Toronto. From there became justice and social policy advisor to the premier of Ontario second half of first mandate, and really focused on attorney general, solicitor general, but health, education, community, and social services. So the entire array of government. But it was a time when the role of the Law Society and the Law Society Act in Ontario was being reformed quite dramatically on a number of different things. But the issue of doing law better and how do we regulate lawyers, who should be entitled to practice law, and how do we actually serve the public interest and the consumer interest and a consumer welfare perspective was something that for me was coming front of mind and simply wasn't part of the dialogue or the debate. So in the late 1990s, it was all about multidisciplinary practice and are the accountants coming to take over? And so 
naturally, I ended up migrating to one of the big four accounting firms. I went to PricewaterhouseCoopers, where I had responsibility for their Canadian multidisciplinary practice initiative. I helped them set up what became their affiliated law firm, Wilson and Partners in Toronto in 2001, in Vancouver in 2002. And I had responsibility in-house with PwC until 2004, and then as external counsel for the following decade for policy, regulatory, and other related matters that I also branched into relating to post-Enron corporate governance concerns. So in terms of regulation of lawyers and accountants, I like to say I'm almost functionally bilingual, Martine, lawyer and accountant, although I'm not a CPA. (laughs) Part of what emerged at that point, though, is that I realized I write when I'm really irritated. And so I actually took a year's leave to go to Stanford to work on a master's where I was actually writing about the multidisciplinary practice debate. It was actually really good therapy to work out some of these ideas. Get a few more letters after the name and actually got admitted to the doctoral program at Stanford and started to flex the academic muscle in that respect. And my doctoral work at Stanford was actually building on two different strands. One was on the future of regulation of lawyers looking at Uh, threats to self-regulation of the legal profession in comparative perspective. So Canada, US, UK, Australia, New Zealand, lots of really interesting things going on at the time between 1998 really and 2006, 2007. Completed that work in 2008. But in the meantime, I had switched to become a full-time academic. So I took my first appointment as an assistant professor in the Faculty of Law at Queen's University. I went to California actually in 2008 I was recruited by the former general counsel of the Central Intelligence Agency and National Security Agency, who was my dean, to head what was called an Ethics Across the Professions Initiative at Pacific McGeorge in Sacramento. Um, but at, through that work, got very directly involved in what was going on in the U.S. context. So I chaired the Canadian Bar Association's Ethics and Professional uh, Issues Committee. But I, as a result of an article that I wrote, not unlike Mitch's experience, I got invited to speak at the Fordham annual ethics conference and wrote about threats to the legal profession and the reliance of lawyers on this core values rhetoric to maintain a professional monopoly. Be careful what you write because you might get invited to get to do stuff from it. And so I was appointed as what they call reporter to the American Bar Association's Ethics 2020 Commission. And I had direct responsibility and a few of the battle scars to prove it still for alternative business structures and proposals for regulating uh, lawyers and the potential for lawyer reform that went down in flames in 2012 and 13 in the United States. So from there, um, and had had parallel academic career, I actually moved from California to Alberta in 2014. So you go from a California winter to an Edmonton winter, which will give you a sense of my sanity, but I became the Dean of the Faculty of Law in 2014 honored and privileged to come back and have continued that work around lawyers in the future of law and regulation ever since. A couple of things I've been working on recently in 2020, I was appointed to the American Bar Association's National Committee on Professional Regulation, which looks not only at the detailed ethics rules, but also at future trends. What do we need to be paying attention to? Also in 2019, 2020, I was appointed to the Arizona Supreme Court's working group that direct directly developed the rules to implement their astonishingly forward-looking future of legal services report. We'll come back to talk about that later on. So practice, policy, teaching, a few other things along the way, and a couple of the themes have been innovation and change, and I'm really glad to be here with two of the leaders and yourself, Lena, for a wonderful conversation. Thank you. Um, I don't even know where to start. There's so much to dig into with each of you. I think where I want to actually start those, I want to start with this idea of creativity. I come from the position that for things to ultimately change in the legal industry, we need bravery. But along with that bravery, we also need creativity. Paul, I know from our earlier conversation, we we did meet before the panel, that you believe there's a restraint on creativity. Um, Maybe some of your writing, Mitch, maybe some of your writing and Martine, some of your experiences, maybe demonstrate that there is that restraint on creativity. Why do you think that is, and how do you think we get over that block of creativity in order to make change in the industry? Um, Paul, we'll start with you, and then Martin, maybe you can go in after him. I'm going to pick up two strands, Zena, to sort of set the stage a little bit. One is actually from legal education, which, with noted exceptions, is fairly backward-looking and reluctant to embrace change. 
there becomes a bit of an echo chamber when people are hiring each other into faculties and innovators as deans and others aren't always necessarily rewarded, quite the contrary sometimes. So it starts there in terms of how are we forming new lawyers? And you'll hear later on this afternoon, I understand from Chris Bentley, who's one of the innovators in terms of different models of approach there. But I'll just set the stage to say, I've been a professor now in Canada and the US, and I've been an academic administrator in Canada and the US, and universities are not necessarily the place to foster change. That's sort of consistent again with a profession that actually, well, certainly at least in the common law jurisdictions, looks backwards. What, you know, what's precedent? How dare we do something new? How dare we innovate? And you end up with regulatory structures that until very recently were reluctant to embrace change. And I'll come back to talk about the sandboxes because I actually don't think they're as radical as everybody suggests. That being said, there are some brave innovators and what's been interesting in the US in contrast to other places is that they've come from the judiciary not necessarily the profession. The other thing that the, has happened is that the disruptors in the US have often been lawyers who can't find a way to do things within the regulated space, so they get outside of it. Well, those are very great points, uh, Paul. And, you know, I'll come at it with a different, my experience and a different tackle, but I, you know, creativity comes with collaboration. Like you need a diversity at the table and you need people to play nice and work together. Um, I think lawyers feel very comfortable dealing with other lawyers and you, we're just starting to see at the leadership table of some of the key legal players, uh, people that were not trained as lawyers. But if you only invite people to discuss problems that have the same trainings, hang out with the same people, their spouse are lawyers, like you're going to get the same answers. And uh, it's just like, it's like, I bring this story sometimes because people forget, like, we all think that lawyers are not that bad, but like, I've attended a number of conferences with Jeff next to me and people would ask him where he articled and say, like, I did an article. I'm a co-founder of a law firm. And people would actually walk away from the conversation. Just look for the first opportunity instead of saying, Oh my God, like, what do you see as different? Like, what are the experiences you're bringing to the table? So, you know, we, we hear a lot of discussion about diversity in all sorts of industries. I think it is crying in law. And it's made, the problem is compounded by the fact that we cannot properly reward people that don't have a legal training because we're not supposed to be sharing our fees with people that are not lawyers. The structure is very constricted. The whole way that you can find a way to incentivize People that are not lawyers to come to the party, have some great ideas, is, is restricted in every corner. So I'll say this, like the people that are legal innovators in this rules have become very creative at trying to find ways around those rules. But imagine what we could do if the rules were much more permissible and we were not spending all that time just trying to find a way to start being creative. Mitch, do you want to weigh in here? Yeah, let me just jump in. There's some some good points here. I, um, let's start with law school. Paul mentioned law school. It, you know, it, it begins in law school in the sense that failure is bad. So we're learned that failing is a really bad thing. We have to work really hard and score a lot of points to get into this institution. And, you know, I got to work really hard to keep my standing because I need to get a job, you know, and life will be good after that. But this fear of failure, law school doesn't give students permission to fail. It doesn't create an environment where failure is not catastrophic. And so that carries through into the law firm environment where you're drained in thinking, I cannot make a mistake. God forbid something goes wrong. The, law, the client's going to sue me and lots of bad things will happen. And sure, that's correct. But creativity in the sense, if that um, stops your creativity in thinking about how your services are delivered, that's a bad thing. And so lawyers are just trained that all failure is bad. That's a problem. We're trained to be know-it-alls instead of learn-it-alls, right? My, that's Microsoft famously talks about this learn-it-all culture instead of a know-it-all culture, because as lawyers, we're not supposed to fail. So we automatically know more than everyone else. 
So there's no possible way we can collaborate, as Martin said, with those other people, those non-lawyers that we talk about. So it all, feed, it all feeds on itself. Law is also not a team culture. It re, like even in a law firm environment, we're not a team. You guys, you guys, when you work at the law firm, you're not a team. You're a bunch of individuals who share space and operate together and hopefully make some money. But really, it's you know, you're competing against every single person in your law firm, just as you did in law school, you're competing against every single classmate. So there is no sense of we're stronger together as a team. It's I'm going to work really hard. You're going to work really hard. And somehow magically it comes back. So it all wraps in together as a culture um, amongst lawyers. So it's, it's a problem. So I love that you leverage the Microsoft example. I mean, that's really where Microsoft gets its idea around the growth mindset. And to have a growth mindset versus a fixed mindset is really about those things that you talk about. It's about collaboration. It's about culture. It's about going from a knowing culture, which is built on precedent, which is you know what our legal system is built on, versus uh, a learning culture, which is not really something that lawyers in the legal industry is really strong at. And you, when you contrast that with the idea that you know, play nicely in the sandbox. Everybody play nicely in the sandbox. Let's play, pick up on this idea of legal sandboxes and how they're popping up in jurisdictions all over the place. We talked about Arizona, California. Um, let's talk about the sandboxes. Uh, Mitch, what do you think about legal sandboxes, where we're at today, where we have to go? Okay, well, there's, there's three in Canada so far, right? Um, Ontario, which is a weird sandbox, and I'm in Ontario. So, um, I don't have a lot of love for what's happening with the law society there, but they've decided to go with a legal strict legal tech sandbox where legal tech companies will come and be supervised by the law society and create some kind of magic. I, I guess it's, it's, it's still early days. We don't know exactly what, why I would join your sandbox other than, you know, I want to be watched by the law society, which is not particularly appetizing. Um, and so we'll see what happens there, but it is restricted just to tech. So they're not looking at anything else. BC is looking at access to justice. So their sandbox is a little bit broader and saying, from an access to justice perspective, bring us your ideas, bring us whatever it is you're doing. Maybe it's tech, maybe it's how you structure yourself, what have you, and that's what we'll look at it. But it has to be A to J. So now Alberta has recently announced, we're gonna create a sandbox, you know, bring us your ideas, do whatever you want, and we'll take a look at it. And that to me is, well, it's, it's obviously the most liberal approach to it, and I think is the right approach. And hopefully some nice ideas will come out of it. Uh, but again, it, they are supervised by the regular who, regulator, who is the law society, who is comprised of lawyers, who may or may not feel that these things um, are in the lawyer's best interest. But I'll let the other two, I, I know the other, Martine and Paul have some strong words to say. <laughs> I have to jump in before Paul, because otherwise we might run out of time because Paul has so much experience and mm. in, in ideas on this. But I'll, I'll just I'll just throw in throw in my my two bits on this is like when the first um when the first sandbox came out like I was excited I was like man I, I've been waiting for this like uh, more than 10 years to see something coming out like finally like people are moving then I started reading the rules and looking at this and thinking like okay we're doing in my business in my world with the people I talk to some people have some pretty good ideas there's always an incubator on the back end we're trying stuff we're running a current business planning the future business when I'm thinking of the future business like, should I consider going for a sandbox? It's like, will it open up like financing? All right. Hmm. I don't know if investors will be that excited that we're permitted to do this for the next three years, but beyond that big question mark, um, then I'm like, okay, well, I'm licensed in Ontario, but what if my services are national? Like, am I going to run a fall of the other rules in the other jurisdiction? Hmm, that's not been considered either. Um, and what if like, I'm getting refused. I apply and they refuse me. Now my idea is dead. I, like I saw a lot of obstacles that made me think like it's it's really nice. I, I appreciate the efforts, but are we 
a little bit off mark and uh, I'm opening the door so well for you, Paul. I hope you appreciate that. <laughs> Martine, I appreciate it completely and your very kind and gentle way of saying I do, I am known for going on a little bit. So I'll try and keep this <laughs> uh, And I'll, yeah. keep my, I'll keep my comments focused on a, a couple of strands from a U.S. perspective because this may be something that your audience in Canada is not necessarily as familiar with. Because there really are two distinct approaches. And actually, there's Canadian content in the first and probably most well-known sandbox. Jillian Hadfield, who's now back at the University of Toronto, was deeply involved in the development of the sandbox in Utah that has probably received the most attention and was first out of the gate. And that was actually done uh, largely under the auspices. Uh, both the dean at the BYU Law School was very directly involved and uh, Judge or Justice, and I'm sorry, I don't have the exact title, Dino Himonis from the Utah courts who saw this as a way to open up a marketplace to try and facilitate greater access to justice because the U.S. constraints, very much like the Canadian ones, you know, the non-lawyer, Rule 5.4 prohibitions on fee sharing, restrictions on advertising, all of these sorts of restrictions that are very much check the box in the U.S. were really impeding the sort of development of or facilitating innovation and creativity unless people wanted to go outside of the regulatory space. And there they open themselves up to unauthorized practice of law prosecutions. So there's that hammer sitting out there that if you don't play well in our space and we don't open up our space to you, we're going to come after you. And I'll have one illustration of that where there's actually a sandbox in Florida that's being uh, developed right now. But one of the most recent cases out of Florida was a prosecution of an outfit called Ticked or Ticked, T-I-K-D. It's about a 29-page judgment out of the Superior Courts in Florida. Worth a read because they went after an app for the unauthorized practice of law and provision of legal services, even at the same time as they're trumpeting the development of a regulatory sandbox in that space. So you've got those sorts of contradictions and I think Martine is quite right. I got into a robust debate actually on LinkedIn about you know, how, how good is a, a regulatory sandbox with a few people who didn't necessarily appreciate that venture capitalists don't want the uncertainty of, well, your pilot might last for three years and then we might change our minds and the whole thing's done. And so capital formation has been a traditional problem for a lot of law firms for reasons that we're, would go on beyond this panel. And one of the things that came out of the Arizona approach in contrast, and this is really the second strand was, we need to change the rules, not on a provisional basis, not on a let's have a sandbox so we can gather data and figure out what we, no, no, no. They just took a bold step, moved forward. But remember, Arizona was the first place to blow open legal advertising for better or worse. There's some great videos, but in le looking at leading change, they changed the rules. And so one of the things that I, I won't get into the, the granular details, but one of the most important developments actually in September was that a, an affiliate of LegalZoom has now opened up under the Arizona rules. And that has the potential to blow the entire market open because consumers quite clearly have seen a need for this sort of service. And if you look back at some of the stuff I was writing about in 2007, 2008 about legal services reform in the UK, it was actually their competition authorities, the Office of Fair Trading, that said to the profession, you'd better change the way you're doing this or we will do it for you. That instituted and implemented considerable change in the UK. The sky didn't fall in. Arizona, it's still early days, but the court has appropriate protections in place. And I think the ethical guardrails that really well-intentioned people can put in place and monitor and protect will not prevent everything from you know, potentially going wrong. But if we don't take a risk, we'll never know. And so in that respect, at least, the creativity and change that's been facilitated, again, we'll see what happens in the rest of the US, but cautious, cautious, cautious. As I said, I've been working on this stuff since 1998, and that's now getting to a long time and accounts for a few of my gray hairs. Well, let me, let me just jump in because what listeners should also remember, there's this place called Australia, that Absolutely. actually predated the UK uh, regulatory change by, well, they started in the late 90s and then really kicked into gear early 2000s. So there is, if we're going to take the backward looking approach or the precedent approach, there is ample precedent over an ample amount of time to suggest 
that any concerns people had are overblown. And yet there was still this reluctance to look at that evidence and say, we're different. And I guess that's the other thing I have, the problem we have as a culture is Canadian, you know, Alberta is different. We're not Arizona. We're not the UK. We're not New South Wales. And that's, that's problematic. But anyways, just no, it's a it's a great point, Mitch. And it, it, it's funny because like the parallel I was making in my mind is I remember in the early days of the cloud, like people were freaking out about data security for the cloud. And what I was thinking was like, is this better for the server in my basement that can be flooded? That can like, you, you know, we always want to we, we look at the problem without considering what's the alternative. So right now we're trying to say, well, today, like everything is all fine and dandy, like the lawyers are regulated, we have a strong ethic um, code and like we can really tackle and protect the public. But like, is, is it really the baseline? Because if we do nothing, this is happening today. People are delivering legal services and are answering the needs that what was the last survey in BC? I don't have the stat in me, but like something like 70% of the population said they had some legal needs that couldn't be answered by a lawyer and didn't reach out. It's like, so at some point, something's going to give. And, and if you look at it as just like, we keep the system as is, or, or we improve it incrementally, or like, should we think about like what's happening that we don't see, that the regulator is not seeing, that there's absolutely no protection whatsoever. Um, I think sometimes like there's the cloud effect, like that the oh, the cloud is really scary, but the basement should be also scary. So that's my two two bits there. Well, well let me just jump in one more time. It is if lawyers really are, if, if the, our system now is really the best system, if it then we shouldn't need any disciplinary disciplinary conduct hearings because we're all good. We're all super ethical. We don't steal money from our trust accounts. We don't do bad things. But we see those things happening in our current system. So if we're really not that great, how can we suggest that others are, are less ethical than us? We, we haven't been blessed with a magical cloak of, of eth ethics when we get called to the bar. So it, anyways, the, uh, this is driving me a bit nuts. So that's why I jump in. Zina, well, but take you over. Have. That's I'll why stop. us non, but, but you have Mitch, that's why us non-lawyers can't participate in, in your world in quite the same way, right? Right. One of the things, if I might Zina, on that is that there are some really creative ideas about how to bring people together. So uh, after I finished off my deanship, I spent a year on sabbatical. And part of that was as a visiting scholar at the American Bar Foundation in Chicago, which happens to be in part of a building connected to Northwestern. Northwestern has this amazing master of science in law for kind of tech folks and others to get exposed, but really also to you know, intermingle with the JD students or others, you know, God forbid we actually have others in our class who are actually thinking in a different way about the same problems. And so in that respect, at least, some of the conferences there, some of the things going on at Stanford's Codex, there are institutes and points of light around the world that are thinking creatively and differently back to the way that you started the conversation, but incentivizing them and making sure that they're not giving up in frustration, I think is some, you know, some of us have been at this for a little while and we keep pounding our heads against it, but we keep doing it because there is that need and there needs to be a better way. I mean, something like a service that, you know, again, I don't need to get into the stats to talk about unmet legal needs. How many conferences have we been at about unmet legal needs? How many trees have been felled or the electronic equivalent about how we haven't provided access to justice? Why can't you go into the Canadian Automobile Association and buy your tickets for Disney, book your travel, and get help with your will? And in terms of actually the way in which we get services to market, particularly, and I remember back, and I'm sure Martine and Mitch, you might have had the same uh, sort of feeling when you were in big law. I couldn't afford to hire myself. There's a problem with that. And you know, you start valuing your time and your energy and effort. I won't even get into the billable hour. 
there are ways in which this can and should be done better if we create the space for that to happen and we create the right incentive. And so in that respect, at least what Mitch and Martine have been doing, and Martine living this for a decade plus, is to try and think about different ways and then put it into practice. Those practice experiments need to be facilitated and assisted, not threatened, not threatened by time, not threatened by approvals in a sandbox project, but rather to say, change the mindset. This can be and should be ethical. How do we facilitate it rather than prevent it? So conscious of time and the fact that we're going to get the hook in a couple of minutes here. Um, Martine, I'm going to go to you. I don't want to leave all of our viewers. We've had a great day so far. I don't want to leave us in a, in a state of doom and gloom. We can get there. There is positive things that are happening. I mean, you're living and breathing it every day, as Paul said. What's your wish for the future of the, of the profession and how can we get there in 30 seconds or less? And Mitch, be prepared. You're next. I want to I want to encourage everybody to to adopt an improve together mindset. Like if we stop looking at things as like it's going to fail or it's going to be a success, but how can we improve? Let's let's give it a try and move on. That that really infinite mindset that you were talking about, Zena. That's my wish is that we start training lawyers at law school to have this abundance mindset. Nobody's going to eat your cheese if you if you find great ideas. It, all boats will rise. It's a big saying. And if we could, if we could just start playing nice with each other, start at law school, but also like, you know, some people could consider Simplex to be in some ways a competitor to good lawyer. And here they are inviting us to talk today and collaborating together and finding ways to do things better. That's the mindset I'm, I'm wishing on our industry so that we can expand and have a greater future. Thanks. Well, I, I don't know how I top that. That's that's brilliant. Let me just take it to the law school issue because I teach my students and, and I try to impress upon my students is that there are so many avenues and so many opportunities for you that were not there 20 years ago and that you should be broadening your horizons in terms of what your career will look like. And one of those things is to think very seriously. And I know a number of the people when I've seen the comments on other um, other speakers is there's a lot of solos and smalls out there. This is a, th this in my mind is got a massive future, right? So coming out of law school and being afraid and defaulting to a big law firm, I think is a mistake. And so if you could just broaden your horizon and think about what my small practice would look like and put in place all the things that Martine is doing and what others are doing and using the technologies. You don't need to be an ABS. You don't need a sandbox. You just got to think more critically about how to create a better customer experience. And Paul? I'm essentially an optimist and I remain optimistic that people will find the right path and the right way forward to serve that consumer interest, to be ethical, and to come up with creative and innovative change. You've got a couple of incredible panelists here who've been doing that all the way along. There are many other points of light. Find them, listen to them. There are mentors, there are advisors, there are creative thinkers, and get yourself, as people have said, into that abundance or creative mindset to think differently about problems. The, this is the way we've always done it isn't a response anymore. It's how can we do it better and, and for a broader audience to serve that public interest, to conserve the consumer perspective, and to frankly probably make better lawyers and good lawyers as well. Thank you for that. Couldn't have, couldn't have said it better myself. Well, I appreciate all of your time here today, um, particularly coming in from wherever we are in various parts across the country. And uh, you've given us a lot to think about. You've given us a lot to um, look forward to as well. And I appreciate that. So thank you all very much for being here.